So the skin is inhabited by more than 1 million bacteria per centimeter square, co-participating in maintaining the physical barrier function to external environment and preventing the penetration and invasion of pathogens. Welcome to the Learn Skin Podcast with me, Dr. Raja. And me, Dr. Hadar, where we discuss all things skin. Join us as we delve into the art and science of skin health in today's episode. Hey, Raja, can you say the thing I told you to tell them? Of course. We are board-certified dermatologists. This podcast is meant for educational and informational purposes only and is not considered medical advice, nor does it serve as a substitute for professional care by a doctor or other qualified medical professional. All opinions shared do not express the views of Learn Health, Inc. Let's get to the good stuff. Hey, Raja, how are you today? Hey, Hadar, what's up? You know, I've been hearing some buzzing. Have you? Yes. You know, there's a lot of buzz going around the skin microbiome. You know, those critters that live on us, around us, inside of us. And now that the research has opened all kinds of methodology to look into what's in the microbiome, there's so much data exploding and sometimes it's hard to make sense of it. You know, we need some help. Yeah. But you know, I was thinking about a different kind of buzzing. Don't you hear those Burt's Bees? Ooh. Ooh, I hear that. Oh, now that you mention it. Yes, of course. Yeah. And, you know, I think they have been such a partner with us. And we're pretty excited to do this interview with Dr. Hamali Gunt, who is the head of clinical and scientific affairs. She's been so awesome about talking through research with us on multiple occasions. And Hamali, thanks for joining the podcast. Hi, Raja and Hadar. It is so wonderful to be chatting with you guys again. And you two are really funny. You guys always want to make a joke about the buzz, don't you? Oh, my God. You know what? We are all a buzz. This is all dad joke central. But what I was going to say is, you know, every time you come on, I think we say it's like meeting an old friend. At this point, are we family? I think so, right? I think it's like you've been on the podcast enough times now that we're going to have to put you as the Learn Skin family circle here. But let's, let's talk skin microbiome because I think... One of the things that we had been discussing here is just so much buzz around the microbiome. Can you start us off by just describing what is the skin microbiome and why should we care about it? Definitely. So I'm actually going to, you know, I, I think I always do that. I take a step back. I'll start off with, you know, the most common version that is often heard about skin. And this is like the most intro to skin People talk about it being a complex barrier organ made up of lipid bilayers, you know, with the keratinocytes held together, preventing moisture loss and protecting the body from pathogens. But now this definition has evolved. And now there is the incorporation of the skin microbiome whenever one talks about skin barrier. So the skin is inhabited by more than 1 million bacteria per centimeter square co-participating, and I'm going to repeat the word co-participating because that's the key word, in maintaining the physical barrier function to external environment and preventing the penetration and invasion of pathogens. So really it has come, you know, like 20 years ago when I studied it, it was all about the acid mantle and the lipid bilayer. And now there is one more addition, which is the microbiome. And together, all of these are the crucial components of the skin barrier. It is so interesting that you present this as key partners with us in maintaining health. And to me, when I think about integrative medicine, our approach in general is always to fortify health, to restore balance. And I know balance is a lot of the terminology we use when you talk about the microbiome. Perhaps you can tell us about some of the common disruptions that we see or what do we do to our skin every day that really messes up the microbiome? Today, it is well-established fact that healthy microbiome is healthy skin. And in terms of its uh, role, really broadly speaking, I, I look at it as you know twofold. We touched upon the barrier function. Essentially, the skin microbes, they secrete protease enzymes, which, you know, helps in desquamation process, the stratum corneum renewal. Then there is production of all these biofilms and quorum sensing, which I find fascinating, and I have so much more to learn in this space. But the skin microbiota essentially plays an important role in protecting against potential pathogenic 
microorganisms, either by competition or there is the antimicrobial peptide production. So that is one primary role. And then the second would be the training and communication with the immune system. And again, I go back 20 years, you know, when I was learning about the skin immune system, it was all about the innate and the acquired immunity. But there was really no talk about how the bacteria or the microbiome plays a role there. And there is a close relationship that the commensal bacteria of the skin have with the host immune cells from the very beginning of, you know, our lives. And the T cells are trained to respond to potential transitory pathogenic bacteria. So this collectively, the microbiome is such an important part of the barrier. And for the longest time, all the disruptions in the skin barrier have been focused on, you know, what is happening with the transepidermal water loss. Is the skin hydrated and things of that nature? But we are starting to realize that there are more disruptions being caused by a variety of things. And that, in fact, also impacts the microbiome and any dysbiosis that is caused in the microbiome potentially has, you know, an effect in causing some kind of a skin disease or a skin condition. So the the classic example actually that comes to mind is atopic dermatitis. And you guys see that so much, but it's a classic example where we have the SREs microbial colonization and infection. Then in inflammatory acne, which affects, you know, about 10, 15% of the population, it is associated with pea acne. And similarly, we are finding different organisms that are responsible for or play a role in psoriasis and even in conditions of the scalp like dandruff. So there is in general an agreement that dysbiosis contributes to various skin disorders And therefore, it is really important that we keep the skin microbiome in check. You know, you mentioned so many different things. It's almost too hard to unpack. There's so much information. One of the things I want to point out is the concept of dysbiosis or imbalance. I know we always think about disease around us in terms of absolutes, right? An infection means there's a lot of bacteria. They're causing a lot of damage, a lot of symptoms. Yet a lot of the diseases we see in dermatology are kind of chronic diseases that kind of come and go and have a lot of inflammatory component to them. And perhaps there is a, you mentioned so accurately, the association with dysbiosis as opposed to direct causality. And maybe in the future, we will know to actually look and see, okay, this is exactly, tease out exactly what we're doing. And I wanted to ask you in that context of, you know, because to me, it's always with the microbiome is we only know what we can see, right? Before we could only look with a simple microscope. Now we use more genetic methods. Where are we with the methodology right now that you utilize so you can give us some background? Because I know you're going to tell us about a study you did. So maybe you can introduce some of the innovations and methodology that has been coming around with regards to studying the microbiome. And then we can delve into some of the information that you have in your study. Definitely. So, you know, for the longest time, I mean, I I think I was reading a paper which was written by Heidi Kong, and it talks about well into the early 1950s or 60s, there was research going on on the skin surface and culture methods were used and they are really hard and all of the different organisms have different, you know, culture conditions. So that is a factor in, you know, are you able to really sample? Are you able to culture? Are you able to grow the bacteria to even identify what really is available, right? But in the last, I want to say probably it's been, I don't know, is it 10, 15 years or or more? This whole genomic sequences has taken, you know, a leap, right? And the development of these molecular technologies which are able to identify and quantify microbial organism has shifted the way we are looking at skin microbiome. Just in general, the characterization of the diversity, which relies on the sequence analysis, and I really don't know all the details that go into it, but it is essentially around the 16S ribosomal RNA, and which we know that it's it's present in all the bacteria and the RK, and that is one of the reasons we are able to use the methodology. And yeah, so we don't need to rely on cultures currently, and which is, which is like I said, great for understanding and learning about the skin microbiome. 
Well, Hamali, this is really interesting because now we're delving into the details on what the microbiome is, but then that leads us to the, I think, a very, very important question that a lot of people are asking, which is how do the skincare products and the cosmetics that people are applying to their skin every day, how do they impact the microbiome or do we know all the impacts that are there and who's studying it? And I, I mean, I don't mean that totally rhetorical because I know you're studying it, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious, do people think about this as much as we think they do? Are the consumers asking and are people seeking answers for how is this shifting my microbiome? Right. You know, this is such an important question. And if we look at everything that has happened in the skin microbiome research, we see that a lot of it is focused around disease skin conditions. You know, I mentioned acne and AD and, and rightly so. In fact, the AAD research portal, you know, talks about skin disease being number four, I think, of all diseases. And one in every four American has a skin condition. But we forget one very important fact, and that is that irrespective of whatever skin condition you have, whether it is diseased or not, but everybody is really using skincare products every single day, whether it's a cleanser, a lotion, all of these things, everyone is typically using. And in the last five years, I think there have been a couple different surveys that I've conducted, which show that most people, including women, they use at least eight products every day. So we are exposing ourselves to a lot of these ingredients. Wow, Raja, you know, we need to get ourselves some more time a day. Eight products a day? Eight products a day. And that includes like, you know, the shampoo and toothpaste. And- uh, Hadar, are you, are you, are you oh, getting okay, jealous, right. my friend? Do you feel like you need more products? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'm like, I, I can barely afford to have eight meals. You know, but- <laughs> Well, you don't need to have eight meals. It's not good for your gut microbiome. (laughs) Yeah, but apparently your skin can get eight meals a day. (laughs) So in the last couple of years, there has been very scattered research, really. I think one research shows, you know, that frequent washing disturbs the skin barrier, which we know already. And then they implicated that, you know, there can be changes in the microbiome, which I guess is logical and, you know, clearly they they measured and they were able to show some changes. And then cosmetics, hygiene products, makeup, moisturizers, all of them also have been implicated in modifying the skin microbiome. And there are very weak correlations, but the understanding is still really in its early stage. You know, the big factor is we don't know how much is really being topically applied for how long or how it is applied. So this impact of skin microbiome, the impact of cosmetic skincare products on skin microbiome is relatively unknown. And then when we look at the products, right, I mean, there are active ingredients, obviously, they come with preservative systems, because you want to protect your product from contamination. And there was this interesting piece of research, which showed that irrespective, well, they used a couple different preservatives. But because the level of the preservative is small, you know, it's typically 1% or less, What they found is that the skin microbiome didn't change really much when it was compared to the untreated control, which did not have a preservative. So overall, a skin microbiome is pretty intelligent. It knows, it finds a way to balance itself when, you know, when these small changes of ingredients come into play. But now when we talk about long-term exposure to products, you know, we have regimens that are used for months on end. How how do those products really interact with the microbiome? We don't know that. And we at Burt's Bees are taking a stab at it. Well, gosh, Tamali, tell us more about how you're doing that. What are the studies that you're doing or what data have you uncovered about the microbiome and, you know, how ingredients interact with it? Sure. So I'm going to be sharing like, you know, one very crucial study that we conducted. There is a lot more in the pipeline and I hope to be able to share it with you guys. relatively. <laughs> only soon. here, only here, Hamali, on the Learn Skin podcast, yes. right? Because, you know, this is the place to be. Exactly. I think in the last couple of years, you guys probably are aware, you know, we launched a product line called Renewal, which contains Bakuchiol, and it is a natural retinol alternative. In the past, our work has shown that the product significantly improves signs of aging. It reinforces the skin barrier, and it is even gentle for daily use in sensitive skin population. So we are evolving this work now. 
And the reason we tested these products is because we know that retinoids, retinols, all of these, they interrupt the skin's natural microbiome just by the way of their mechanism. So with the information that we have on our products, we have yet another data point to show that our products are gentle. We were able to not just maintain, you know, the skin health through the objective measurements of the barrier function and, you know, clinical grading, but now through the ability to not disrupt the skin microbiome, which our products were able to show. So we conducted a series of in vitro assays, and then we took it to the clinical studies. And the in vitro assay was really a starting point for us because one very crucial issue that stems from clinical or in vivo studies is that, you know, it's not standardized and controlled because there are people, you know, that that's a huge variable. So we looked at the in vitro method to analyze our cosmetic products for the potential to disrupt or disturb the human skin microorganisms. So the influence of the product on healthy skin balance and on the microbial diversity was studied by incubating a co-culture of S. S epidermatitis, S. aureus, P. acne, and a couple other microorganisms with the product. And the ratio of microbes to each other and the control were determined. And through that, we showed that the products did not have much influence or very little influence on the tested microbes. That meant that it was not detrimental to the microbiome. And then the next logical step, obviously, was to test it in a clinical setting. And here we conducted a baseline controlled clinical study on female subjects. The subjects used the bakuchiol-containing regimen, which was the cleanser, a moisturizing cream, a firming serum. They used it daily, twice daily for four weeks. And microbiome swabs of the cheek area near the nasal labial fold were collected at baseline and at week four. And then the analysis was done via 16S RNA, which showed no significant differences when it came to the phylum family genus species when the baseline and week four data were compared. We did see a slight increase in the alpha diversity. It was not statistically significant, but at week four, we did see that. And, you know, the idea is if we probably conducted for a longer duration, we might see some changes which we were not able to capture within the four-week period. But through this work, we have shown that natural retinol alternative bakuchiol containing skincare regimen preserves the microbial integrity of the skin, which was really important to us. You know, we we were a little nervous heading into the study that is it going to work? What are we going to see? But this is a good starting point. And then we have a lot more that we are building on on this. So Molly, I want to comment on this because we do quite a few skin microbiome studies and we've looked at this sort of thing and actually just comparing to the literature. Mm-hmm. First of all, I want to say kudos to your team for doing the study and, you know, putting yes. in the resources to do that because, you know, these are the kind of things that we need to see. I think one of the questions that comes up is preservatives. You know, are the preservatives going to change the microbiome and shift it? And actually the answer is yes, they do. And in fact, there have been multiple preservatives that have been shown to do that. So I think when people listen to this and say, oh, there was no shift in the microbiome, they may be thinking, oh, gosh, I guess, you know, we were hoping to see that there might be a shift. No, actually, (laughs) in fact, what you don't want is you don't want the shift towards dysbiosis. One of the ingredients that's a player in this that came out in a different study is that the parabens, whether you believe in the controversy of them getting in and doing any sort of hormonal disruption or not, there's independent studies now showing that if you have the parabens they will actually selectively choose for things like staph aureus to live longer than your healthier bacteria, which is not good if you have skin barrier disruption. And so I think for you to show that there isn't a change is actually a big deal because it means that people can confidently apply this knowing that it's not going to disrupt the microbiome. Right. And we definitely do not use parabens as preservatives in our products. So Yeah. Thanks for mentioning that too, Hamali. I think that that's another important point, right? It's not just, oh, the hormonal issues, wh- whether they're true or not. You're also looking at it from an even bigger holistic perspective, which is that how does it actually affect the microbiome? Right. And does it shift it in a negative way or not? So, mm-hmm. Yeah, Roger, thank you for mentioning this because I was thinking about our listeners maybe thinking, wait, what's going on? But I want to remind everybody that these are 
not trying to treat a disease. There's no pathological process, as was uh, Hamali mentioned okay. before, about the dysbiosis that we're trying to repair. Here, we're actually maintaining the balance, keeping things as they are, is actually the goal, usually. You also mentioned an important part in that you saw maybe a trend towards increase in alpha diversity. So perhaps you can help just explain what that is, and is that a good thing or a bad thing? So the alpha diversity essentially means that a higher number means that there is greater diversity, meaning that there are more number of different bacteria, different species that are present on the skin. We were able to just show it directionally. It was not significant, but perhaps, like I said, if we conducted the study for a longer time, we might be able to see it. And I want to point out that higher diversity or a greater diversity is what is considered to be healthy, whether it comes to, you know, a right. lot of work has been done on the gut microbiome and the oral microbiome. But I mean, I guess greater the diversity, better the health state of that particular tissue. Right. Thank you for mentioning that, because I think it's important to understand the context of the study. We're so used to studying about, okay, you know, you need to Kill. There's too much of it. Kill it. Right. And, and here we're trying to actually support and support diversity of this. I wanted to ask you about this idea because Raj just said kudos for doing this. And I think this is really, really important work. And I'm wondering, do you think this should become the industry standard where, you know, if you want to bring a product to market, you have to take a look at the skin and say, hey, you know, it's not just a barrier issue. There's also the microbiome issue. Oh, that is you just packed so much into that one question. It would be You're welcome. <laughs> you know, it, it is rather ironical actually that the FDA doesn't even recognize the terms like, you know, prebiotic, probiotic, postbiotic, and things like that. And there is a lot of currently just, you know, in terms of if we look at what the challenges are, like regulatory challenges, they do not know how to approach it. Because what do you call these ingredients if they're maintaining it? Is, is it a cosmetic ingredient? Are they considered borderline drugs? How does one manage microbial limits? Right. How is it going to be safe and effective for all? So I just think there are so many more questions right now than answers. I think it's taken us a long time to even get to, you know, the current industry standard of, you know, how a clinical study should be conducted and what are the set of objective measurements we want to include, what are the kind of subjective measurements we want to include. If we throw in the skin microbiome, it's going to create a lot of chaos. I don't think right away, but I think we should slowly start preparing in that direction, probably five years if I'm being too optimistic, or, you know, maybe 10 years down the road, it, it might become a really important parameter to study, just considering everybody's skin is different, right? So how do you maybe right. personalize it? Maybe that's the direction we go. Well, speaking of future directions, maybe you can tell us what other studies are you cooking up in your kitchen? Ah, so a lot more microbiome work going on in all honesty. And it's very much in line with, you know, what the personal care industry is doing. All of the research and innovation is looking at how to protect the skin microbiome. Can we control the presence of beneficial microbiomes? How do we limit the growth of others? Are we able to provide live bacteria to the skin, right? That is one of the biggest challenges right now that is right. being worked upon. So I, I think there is a lot more to come. But in general, I think that a lot of the easiest path right now probably is the prebiotic route, just because of the challenges that occur with probiotics or live organisms. I think it is going to be prebiotics where we see a lot of movement. It is easier to conduct such studies now and we might be able to show the no change or the no disruption in microbiome fairly easily with prebiotic products than something with probiotics or even, like I said, live bacteria. Well, Hamali, I have to ask you then, just to kind of round this conversation out, first of all, I appreciate having such an in-depth conversation about the skin microbiome. What continent are you going to be going to next to figure out the next ingredient that you think is going to be good for the skin and the good for the microbiome? Maybe you're not allowed to tell us, but have you gone to all seven continents? Uh, no, no, I have not. But at the IDS, I picked up the book by uh, Dr. Cassandra Poirier. 
And it's, it's my <laughs> nightly reading and it's really inspiring all the travel that she has done and all the cool plants that she has, you know, rounded up and she's studying. So I think her research is really interesting. I need to chat with her a little more and perhaps that will point me in the right direction. I think what's hidden in your comment is everybody should come to the Integrative Dermatology Symposium. Totally. You will see, <laughs> yes. you will see uh, Dr. Himali Gunt there with the Burt's Bees team, but you'll also meet all kinds of really cool people. When you get a chance to everyone listening, come check us out and come meet the team. Himali, this has been fantastic. I would say that this has given us a better appreciation for the bugs on our skin, not just in our skin. And we appreciate everything that you have been doing to keep pushing the industry forward and just making sure that we really ask the scientifically important questions. Thank you, Raja and Haddad. It's always, always a pleasure talking to you, the both of you. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode with Dr. Raja and Dr. Hadar. This podcast is brought to you by Learn Skin, leaders in integrative dermatology education. Visit LearnSkin.com forward slash podcast to explore our many programs or subscribe to the podcast today and never miss an episode. Hey, have a great day and stay curious.